And I'm the president of the Thank Freedom you. Association. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to what I regard to be the most important session of this whole weekend. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. and I'm so glad that I've got three very, very talented speakers on the, on the panel with me. But I'm going to just abuse my position as chairman for one moment and just say this to you. My, my colleagues who are much more scholarly than I am are going to help me by reminding me after this session who's, who it was who said that in the lottery of life, the greatest prize was to be born an Englishman. Yes. And some people, I think, believe that that was perhaps said because of our beautiful countryside or maybe because of our variable weather. In my submission, and I hope the panel will support me in, in this contention, it was a, the greatest prize to be born an Englishman because we have enjoyed living under English common law. We have not... So now, without um, further ado, I'm first of all going to call upon uh, Daniel Hannan to uh, address us. I know Daniel has just come from another session where he's been uh, eloquent and loquacious. Um, but um, uh, by way of introduction, as you all know, Daniel is the, a conservative member of the European Parliament for the, uh, the South East. Um, he's a, a, a broadcaster, a blogger. And, and an author. And on sale here at our conference today, we have his latest book, How We Invented Freedom mm. and Why It Matters. Matters. Mm. So I, I do urge you all to, to, uh, to buy that book. And then finally, I just want to say that my first encounter uh, with Daniel Hannan was when I went to address the conservative, um, the, the Oxford University Conservative Association when Daniel was a, an undergraduate there and chairman of that association and already he was a member of the Freedom Association. So without more ado, can I call upon Daniel to uh, give his view as to why English common law is so important. Yes. Well, thank, you, thank you very much. Christopher, thank you for voting against the Maastricht Treaty, which is why we invited you on that occasion. And if ever there has been a case of somebody being borne out by events, vindicated by the passage of time, you and the other 20 who voted against Maastricht the first time round stand supremely justified. Why does freedom matter? Which, you know, I was, I've just come back from Australia, where I was promoting the concept that goes with my book, the, the concept of the Anglosphere. And I went to Canberra, which is rather like going to Washington, D.C. It's, it's not a natural home for conservatives. It's a, it's a special city for government workers. But I was keen to go there to see the most distant copy of Magna Carta, which stands in the Australian Parliament. And I, I took a photograph of the blurb because I thought it was so brief and to the point as an explanation of what it is that sets the English-speaking pe peoples apart. This manuscript was written on the other side of the world more than 700 years ago. What meaning does it have that caused it to be treasured over the centuries and shown now with reverence in the Australian Parliament? King John speaks to us from medieval England, acknowledging in writing that no one in society is above the law, not the king, nor his subjects, not the government, nor the governed, as an affirmation that authority should be subject to law arising from the community itself. Magna Carta is the foundation stone of constitutional and parliamentary government. That is why we show it here. Yeah. I don't think you could put it any better than that. The body of law arising from the community itself. That is the truly extraordinary phenomenon that serves the English-speaking peoples as our Torah. <laughs> The text that distinguishes us, and at the same time, the text that speaks universal truths to mankind. <coughs> For a long time, the Great Charter was seen quite consciously as the defining characteristic of all Englishmen. That was the phrase used by John Wilkes when he was imprisoned in the Tower. More than a century before he wrote that phrase, in the same Tower there was a touching scene. In 1649. Summer of 1649, London was a tense and frightened city. The New Model Army was advancing angry and unpaid on the capital. And in order to try and placate the Roundhead soldiers, Parliament appointed their commander, Thomas Fairfax, as Constable of the Tower. And his first act 
on taking up his post, was a reassuring one. He called for the greatest treasure in the tower to be brought before him. Not a crown or a scepter, but an old, desiccated piece of parchment with barely legible Latin script, and as it was brought before him, he breathed, this is that we have fought for, and by God's grace will uphold. Mm -hmm. Well, why was it such a big deal? Why did we make such a fuss of it? We don't make such a fuss of it now. There are, the, the Australian copy is not, although it's a, a, one of the, I think, 11 from the, the 13th century, it's not one of the contemporaneous ones from Runnymede itself. There are four copies of the charter that were from the original ceiling by the king. Two of them are in the British Library, one is at Salisbury Cathedral, one is at Lincoln, and you can go and see them without any great fuss being made. There's no queue, there's no, uh, uh, no security, you can go right up to them, you can drag your protesting children, as I frequently do, and explain to them that one day they'll understand why this matters so much. When the same copy from Lincoln Cathedral was sent to New York for the Great Exposition of 1939, 14 million people crushed in to see it. Second World War broke out while it was still on display. And it was transferred to Fort Knox for safekeeping. The aptest imaginable symbol of what we were fighting for. Namely, a system that elevates the individual above the state. A system that exalts the law over the government rather than simply seeing it as proceeding from the decisions of the executive. That sounds now an almost banal concept because we've had 800 years to get used to it. It's difficult now, it takes a real wrench of the imagination to think how radical, how extraordinary that idea was when it was first adumbrated. This amazing, sublime idea that the law was not just the opinion of the king or the will of the biggest man in the tribe, but that it stood above the government. That there it was, you couldn't see it, or touch it, or hear it. But it bound the king as surely as it bound the meanest serf in the kingdom. That's the phrase that leaps out of the Great Charter. An awful lot of the uh, clauses of Magna Carta nowadays are rather disappointing. When you approach it with all that reverence, you see how much of it is taken up with the treatment of Welsh hostages and inheritance rights for daughters and the terms on which you can borrow money. You think, what's all that about? But then there is this phrase where the signatories agree to bind themselves to the law of the land. Yeah. The law of the land. It's an extraordinary phrase, which is common to us in English, but believe me, it doesn't exist in other languages. Not in the law of the land. Not the king's law. He here is agreeing to bind himself to it. Nor yet the law of the barons and their council who will hold him to it. They, again, are accepting something bigger than they are. Not God's law. That idea had been around at least since Mount Sinai. A law that came up from the people, that was imminent, that was contained in the population as a whole, was the birthright of every free member of that community. That is the essence of Anglosphere exceptionalism. That is the English-speaking people's little secular miracle. And it really is a bizarre system. Nobody would invent it today. It's come to us by tribulation, by accident, by the happiest of circumstances. If you were setting out to design a legal system, you would do what every civil law community in the world does. The logical, natural way of inventing a legal system is one where a law is written down in theory, in, in the abstract, and then is applied to a particular case as and when it arises. That's how the, the whole of the rest of the world pretty much operates. Common law, bizarrely and uniquely, doesn't come down from the government, but rather comes up from the people. It isn't written down in the abstract. It arises organically, practically, case by case, building up like a coral. It therefore assumes residual rights and personal freedom. Mm. There is an intrinsic assumption there that if something is not expressly prohibited, we are allowed to do as we bloody well please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that goes right through our culture, and it comes from 
that system, Roger Scruton, who was trained as a barrister before he became the greatest living British conservative philosopher, had a lovely phrase where he says, the common law does not impose order, but grows from it. It's a symptom of a free community whose members relate one to another as autonomous individuals. And it elevates the individual over the collective, something that set English-speaking society apart from almost every other civilization or model in the world is that there was never any concept of a familial property, of a clan, but that we were all autonomous, we were all, once we reached adulthood, equal under the law. And that has served to keep us safe and free and prosperous. Let me finish with one statistic, Christopher. Every year, the Heritage Foundation, which is sponsoring a meeting at the other end of the hall, even as we speak, ranks the freest economies on the planet. It measures tax rates, regulation, corruptibility of public officials, ease of starting a business, and so on. And it comes out with a league table of where are the freest economies. How does that league table look at the moment? It goes like this. Number one, Hong Kong. Number two, Singapore. Number three, Australia. Number four, New Zealand. Then we have one interloper at number five, which is Switzerland. Then number six is Canada. Only in our present age would anyone think it indelicate to point out what five of those six countries have in common. Plainly, there is something in the common law model that serves to make us not only free, but prosperous. The worst mistake our fathers made was to allow the primacy of an alien legal system, which has begun to alter the relationship between state and individual. And one of the greatest benefits of recovering our independence as a people will be that we once again live under our own ancient laws. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Mark Wallace, who will be known to all of you, I imagine, as the executive editor of Conservative Home. But like uh, Daniel, the first time I met Mark was at, uh, when he was a graduate at Durham University. And having graduated from Durham University, the Freedom Association was extremely lucky and extremely grateful to recruit Mark to come and work in his first job at the Freedom Association. So, Mark, can I invite you to now um, address the subject? Thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you, uh, Daniel. I, I was thinking um, the other day while trying to work out what I would actually say at this meeting, that essentially if I targeted my speech at things Daniel Hannon doesn't know about common law, um, I could get to this point and then sit down, <laughs> as he's just established. Um, I think, the, uh, as a supplement to what Daniel's just said, the core question of um, both the establishment, the value, and, and the present threat um, regarding common law is, sim is a simple one, and as with many simple things, is absolutely fundamental to our existence and, and, and to the, the quality and nature of our lives, which is the simple question of where does freedom live? Where is your freedom, my freedom? Does it reside in a particular document? Does it reside in a particular institution, in a, in a particular person? Um, and of course, uh, it, it's convenient Christopher mentioned uh, Cecil Rhodes' quote about the, for the great fortune being born English, because there's the key. Our freedom is something which is not given to us. It's never granted us. It can't be uh, handed in a transaction from one organisation down to us. It can't be alienated from any one of us to anybody else, um, because it's something we're born with. Um, for those of you who were in, in the previous meeting, where uh, at, the, at the other end of the building, where Ian Murray um, happened to mention, um, as Daniel did, the importance of the 17th century uh, in English history in establishing this understanding of freedom. Um, Ian and I um, had the great fortune to both be educated at the Royal Grammar School in Newcastle, um, which obviously has something in the custard. Not only did it turn out Ian and myself and many other defenders of, uh, uh, of freedom, as, as well as a few rotters, um, it also turned out uh, John Lilburn, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the leveller who I, I'm sad to say is wildly neglected. In, in, in modern Britain, and John Lilburn himself was known uh, as Freeborn John, and this this was the essence of the argument. There long has been the essence of the foundation of liberty, which is it is something we are born with, and I would argue that that applies um, not only to us uh, as as the English and the British, but it applies to anybody else uh, any, anywhere in the world, and this is the essence of the threat which we now face to our common law. Um, how could anyone believe that you could possibly mould together? or reach some kind of uh, bizarre fusion of legal systems 
which, one, one of which, ours, believes that each of us has freedom as soon as we are born, at the very start of our lives, until the day we die, <coughs> that is inherent to us. And that there may be documents which recognize it and assert it, and in which we agree to support and recognize each other's freedom uh, against those who take it away. How could you possibly try to meld a system like that with a system which believes that only when a certain number of bureaucrats or a certain number of judges or a certain number of politicians get together, out of the goodness of their hearts, they may all sign the document granting you freedom. What kind of possible compromise can there be between those systems? And is it any wonder that having tried to grow those two systems together in some kind of bizarre career, um, that actually it, it's, it's turned out to be disastrous? Is there any wonder that so many of our laws, whether they run up against formats of European regulation, whether they run up against the European Convention and the European Court of Human Rights, is it any wonder that that system does not work well with ours? It's the equivalent of putting diesel into a petrol car. <laughs> this is not something where you can reach a compromise and perhaps the two will work together. They are fundamentally incompatible. Um, and I, I'm aware we don't have a huge amount of time, so um, I'll end very swiftly on this note. The key question for us is not just how to recognize the importance of these things, the question is how to successfully defend them and reassert that freedom that we were born with. Um, unfortunately, we have two alternatives, ladies and gentlemen. We have the alternative of looking back on the successful, and in some cases horrific, experiments of history, and being aware of the lessons that other people have undergone the pain of learning, or we have the choice of ignoring those lessons and undergoing the pain and horror of those experiences again. Freeborn John Lilburn did not fight in the English Civil War in order for us to forget that they did it and for someone to have to do it again one day. Um, it, is not, it should not be the case that with the great history of liberty we have behind us, as Daniel's recounted, it should not be the case that we have to yet again discover the problem with denying this concept of innate freedom. It, we should not have to yet again discover the, the flaws in unaccountable power. Um, this is something that can only be answered by education. Um, what do we teach in history in British schools? Well, you might learn a little bit about the Romans, but after the age of eight, you'll oscillate wildly between the Tudors, the Nazis, the Tudors, the Nazis, the Tudors, the Nazis. <laughs> Neither of which, ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest uh, were great champions of accountable power, the innate freedom of the individual, um, or the concept of, uh, of, of the law of the land. Um, why do we not study the documents, the processes, the struggles, and the people who established this recognition of the freedom that we all have. Um, the education system formally may not do it, but this is one of the reasons why the Freedom Association is quite rightly doing so itself. The, um, the, next, the, up, the forthcoming celebrations of Magna Carta will be an opportunity to do this, but I, I hope all of you um, will look, look at some of the documents and, and, and leaflets and so on that the Freedom Association is producing. Um, get copies of them if you can, and help to distribute them and to spread that news, because unless we remember what has gone before, we are, as many people have said, doomed to repeat it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before I call our last speaker, could I just tell you that as chairman, I have a bit of a problem, because not only are we get to hear another speaker, but I want to give you, the audience, some opportunity to participate in this session, but with the certainty of getting you out of this room no later than five to one, so that you've got time to get yourselves tuned, folks, and adjusted for the lunch with Lord Devitt. Now, without more ado, I call upon our honorary chairman, uh, Tim Congdon, who is very well known uh, to you all um, a, a, as a, a leading economist, and if I might say so, Tim, a very well-respected um, economist, uh, also a, an author of uh, many, many pamphlets um, uh, explaining not least the, co the exorbitant cost of the European Union, but Tim, like myself, is totally committed to this concept of the importance of us retaining our in the law which gives us individual freedom. Uh, so, Tim, could I call upon you now to address Thank this um, august right. gathering? Very good. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been told to be brief. I've also been told to explain what the common law is. <laughs> uh, and I've been told to tell you to remember the Freedom Association when you're signing, signing checks and things. Anyway, um, and just very briefly, because Daniel Mark, wonderful, 
actually, many of us, I certainly reached my 40s before knowing really what was d different and special about Britain's, England's, Britain's really legal traditions. And I, you know, I was quite well bred as a young man, and I, I go, but it took me a long time, and many people don't know. Um, in most European countries, they, there is the truth, there is a code, an Napoleonic code, mm -hmm. that is the law, mm -hmm. and that's that. Um, and by the way, the way that um, justice is administered is <coughs> so called inquisitorial. There is a judge who is a, appointed by the state who examines you to find out whether you're guilty or not. The system in the English-speaking world is very, very different. Um, uh, last night, um, I found the intellectual level of the Punch and Genie so too demanding for me, so I left a bit early. <laughs> My, uh, another confession was I actually wanted just to mug up on, on, on Tom Bingham, Lies of the Law, um, and he's got something in here, if, if I can find it correctly, um, which actually explains uh, the, the, about what the... Um, I've lost the page, I'll come back to it. The, the, the guts of it is the law, common law, evolves, which is governed in a sense, but it evolves pre precedent, precedent to precedent. It's evolving all the time as judges reach, a, 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 every, every case is different. Sometimes you can apply existing law, sometimes you have to make a new departure, a precedent is set, and then the judges, the, the lawyers appeal. Um, I was myself first time I defended it in a trial a few weeks, a few months ago, is exactly what happened. They, the lawyers cite the cases that are relevant and try and persuade the judge, given the law, and that's how our system works. It's adversarial, there's habeas corpus, there's trial by jury, and all these things are very different from what goes on in the rest of Europe. And you look at the long run of history, and which is the better system? <laughs> um, and they are not equivalent. No. That is the lie in, mm. in currently going on, and in, in, that is the lie that's going on in these opt-ins for the, for the um, which Christopher has made such a, a gallant stand in saying we must... Okay, let me then finish by saying um, that, um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to hide the fact that I want Britain out of the European Union, and I also want to say that, that Enoch Powell was so totally right in 1972 by saying, the thing that's really wrong about this is we are making the highest court in our land a court in a foreign country. He was absolutely right, and that was always the case. You can bring back that the highest court in our land is in our land is by leaving the European Union.